we are speaking to a princess with a heart of gold today. So honored to have Yang Amat Mulia Tunku Zata Shah Binti Sultan Sharfuddin Idris Shah, Royal Patron of Make a Wish Malaysia, here with us this morning on the Light Breakfast. Good morning, Tunku. Good morning. Good morning to you both. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> We're very excited to have you here because we we we've read a lot about all your great work and uh, to actually have a chance to speak to you. This is great. Thank you so much. Yes, and thanks for this opportunity. I mean, we, we love listening to Light FM, so it's, uh, it's a good oh. Thank you. Such an honor. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about your role as the Royal Patron of Make-A-Wish Malaysia. Well, well I've been um, a Royal Patron for Make-A-Wish Malaysia for, for many years now. Um, basically, I mean, my role is there just to really be a pillar of support for, for the Make-A-Wish family, for the volunteers, for the team. Uh, working alongside with Irene, doing a lot of uh, fundraising, and as well as wish granting. So I do help to develop some of the wishes, um, at least a couple every year. So that's um, really what my, my role is. Uh, and to also to raise awareness about, you know, what we do at Make-A-Wish Malaysia. But what motivated you to give your time for this charity? Because I know you help a lot of other charities. Well, I... For me, it's really that you can see the um, immediate effect and the beneficial impact that we do at Make-A-Wish. Um, you know, when we do a wish and you see the immediate joy and happiness on the wish kid, uh, on the family, on the parents, and we always include the siblings as well because, you know, we know it's a whole family experience. So for me, I really see that, that immediate transformation because that's what we do at Make-A-Wish is really about... Um, transforming lives and giving the children, the, the children with critical illnesses, hope, strength, and joy to be able to battle their critical illness. So when we see that, and we also have the support from the doctors in the hospitals, worldwide make a wish um, uh, have doctors supporting saying you know this should be part of the treatment because you can really see not only um, a physical uh, change and transformation in the child but also emotionally and how that also helps and um, brings the, all the family together so so i think that's why make a wish is so close to my heart <laughs> actually i was just about to ask you that like because make a wish in malaysia how, how much ties do you have to make a wish international and how much influence do they have on you? And do you always ask them for help if you need some? Well, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, we are definitely a very close affiliate because there's affiliates all around the world with uh, Make-A-Wish International. But um, what we do here is really for our Malaysian children and it's run by the Malaysian team and, uh, you know, our support and our donors all come from Malaysians. So, so it's very much a, a local homegrown uh, charity, you know. Doesn't, yeah. it, doesn't it like fulfill your wish to become a fairy godmother, right? Like when we were younger, like I want to be a fairy godmother, <laughs> wave my wand and then your wish really come is. true. And you know, I've got quite a few of the uh, our wish kids who want to become a princess. So they, you know, the girls say, you know, our wish is to become a princess or to meet a princess. So like the fairy godmother, I'll make that happen. <laughs> you're like, ta-da! Right? Ta you're now here at the palace at Istana Slangor and they all dressed up with their tiara. Um, quite a, like last year, um, one child, one wish child, Dia Alicia, she was, uh, she's six years old. And... Um, she has acute lymphoblastic leukemia and her wish was to meet a real princess. <laughs> so did you go with like your tiara and um, no, down? And the tiara. She was the real princess for the day. Right. <laughs> so we organized tea at the at the palace at Istana Slango. We had games, we had cakes, we had all sorts of different um, you know, activities. And each wish child that wanted to be the princess. I always come up with something different so that it's something unique and tailor-made for, for, for that wish child. So for Dia, I also sent her like um, photographs of when I was a kid and I asked her to make a scrapbook and add her photographs when she's a child. So it was like side by side, like the two princesses growing up. <laughs> so she, um, you know, she really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, so, so those are kind of some of the things. But I also do wish kids um, for boys as well. 
I had a great one for one wish child. Uh, his name is Muhammad and he was uh, eight years old. And by the way, all the uh, wish kits that I've done, wish granting for uh, healthy and happy, and they've grown up after so many years and it's amazing how they've transformed and changed to become so confident. Um, and so, you know, they look so well. So I'm like always amazed when I see them and I always keep in touch with them uh, over the years. So with Muhammad, his wish was to um, meet uh, the FAS team and his uh, football hero was the goalkeeper at the time, Aslan. So of course I had to make that happen. <laughs> so um, what we did was we had him on the training ground. He had all his, we, we gave him all his new football gear. It was all signed by the team and everything. So he was playing football on the, on the FAS training ground. And then the next part of the wish was to invite him to watch the match live in the Royal Box with his family. So he came and uh, the special surprise was that I said, okay, so he didn't have a clue what was gonna happen. So he stepped out of the hotel. We said, you're not going in the, in the van with your family. You and your mom are going in Rajamuda Slango's official car. Wow. Riders to the stadium. And he was, he was in so much shock. He was like, <gasps> like so shy, you know? So I was like, you know, you come with your mom. And so they were sitting there and he's waving to the fans and he was <laughs> like the VIP. And um, then he was on the, we were on the pitch itself and uh, the team invited him to warm up with them. So that was really fun. And then he watched the match uh, in the Royal Box with his family. So that's one of the most special wishes that I've managed How to- How is he doing now actually? He's very well, and I uh, still stay, stay in touch with him. Um, I see him on his Instagram. He's grown up because that was about maybe three years ago. So now you know he's a you know young teenager and looking really well, and uh, just happy to see how they progress and and grow up over the years. How does it make you feel to be able to make their dreams come true? I mean, yes, you were a small part of their lives, you know, but now you like they're like your children, you keep in touch with them, you, you uh, look out for them. Absolutely. I mean, that's why I always say, you know, the Make-A-Wish kids are like my kids. And um, the, the feeling that I have whenever I manage to do a wish granting, um, a wish journey and share it with them is just so much, it's so fulfilling and so rewarding just to see the happiness on the child's face because they always come and they're really shy at the beginning. So you've got to warm them up, you know, crack jokes and, and, you know, put them at ease. And then they just, they don't want to go away. After the end of the day, they're like, we want to continue, you know, <laughs> with a wish. And um, it's just amazing to see that. And also to see the siblings, you know, getting, you know, enjoying that, that moment. And uh, usually I'll have the mum come up to me, you know, usually in tears to show how grateful she is. And that just, you know, touches my heart each and every time. So, yeah, that's the, the beauty of what we do at Make-A-Wish. But was there ever a time when you couldn't help a child? Like, what happened? Um, well, there was one time that was quite close to not having a wish being granted. And, uh, but for me, it's like, there is no no. <laughs> Failure is not an option. So I was very uh, persistent and I kept on persevering, like, we've got to make this wish happen. And we eventually did uh, for this wish child. But I remember at that time how, how um, desperate I was feeling, like, you know, I don't want to let this child down. You know, we have to make this wish um, happen. So, but... Alhamdulillah, it managed, uh, we managed to get this wish and really to huge fanfare. So I was really thrilled that we managed to, to, to do that for him. So if you don't mind me asking, what was it? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really say because it was out of, it was circumstances not in my control. So I don't want to put other people into right, right, okay. Okay. All right. But it, it was a great wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I volunteered before for wishes, like only two wishes I volunteered before for Make a Wish really? Malaysia. Um, I remember the first wish, it was postponed and postponed because, um, because of circumstances. Maybe the children had to go to the hospital or the parents were not uh, free and things like that. So like, has there been an occasion where um, you missed out on fulfilling a wish before the child Past. No, I mean, uh, luckily, I've, I've not. So, so every wish that I've been working on or helping to develop, um, we've managed to, you know, make it happen. But, you know, especially like with MCO, it's been 
a worldwide thing with the MCO with COVID-19 that we have this hashtag um, from Make-A-Wish International and Make-A-Wish Malaysia, wishes are waiting because everything got cancelled. Mm. You know, with MCO, everyone's on lockdown. So I was thinking to myself, like, how do I keep the spirits up of our wish kids? Because, you know, they're stuck at home and I'm sure they're disappointed because their wish was supposed to happen and then it couldn't happen. So I was sending, um, I had a list of all our wish kits and I was sending toys, everything I was buying online and sending them toys and gifts and then queer Aya as well. So I was sending them that just to put a little smile on their face, you know, just to say, you know, we're thinking of you and hang on. Um, and since then we've managed to uh, complete a couple of our wishes as well, three wishes for our kids. Um, one was uh, Syed Salman, he's eight years old and he has had a very aggressive cancer in the lymph nodes. So his wish was to have a bus that he could ride in. So Make-A-Wish team, uh, really, they really became so creative and thought out of the box, bought, um, got him this sort of like Volkswagen bus that you could drive at home. And so he's in his bus and he's driving at home, like the little sort of toy, toy car, right? Toy vehicle. So he's riding that and he's like so happy. Uh, we've had other other kids as well, like Mohammed Lukman, who's 11 years old. He has um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and his wish was to have an aquarium at home. So the team have been really fantastic, um, trying to think out of the box to make these wishes happen, so that you know they're not waiting too long for for their wishes. What were some of the most interesting yeah. wishes that that you've got from from children? Um most interesting i don't know i think they're all very interesting sometimes they the, i think one of the most fun was um uh with mukesh this was many years back and he's 11 years old he had leukemia he has leukemia he's still around with us and he's uh, so happy and healthy but his wish was to meet his football idol sergio aguero at man city Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm a Chelsea fan. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so we made that wish happen thanks to Etihad, flew him and his family to Manchester to watch uh, the match live, but not just that, meet with his hero, have his jersey signed by uh, Sergio Ago and the team, and he was the football mascot onto the pitch. Wow. Aguero. <laughs> And uh, that match was Man City versus Chelsea. I remember that. <laughs> Do you remember the score? Yeah, they beat us. <laughs> I was happy. I was happy for him. Man City 3-0. I was like, you know what? I'm very happy for you. <laughs> so Mukesh uh, had the, one of the most amazing, amazing wishes. Wow. I'm just wondering about how like, people donate funds and they, they donate uh, in, in different ways. From, a, from an administrative point of view, how do you deal with that? I mean, is there like a budget per wish? How do you how do you pick and choose which ones to work on? Yes, I mean we have to. Um, you know, part of the policy is to have a cap, so we can't spend more on expenses than than uh, than than how much. So it's it's all about the percentage. But basically, we don't have a limit as such to what the wish is. But as long as the expenses of what we of how we have to organize it doesn't exceed a certain amount so everything's very very sort of very clear um, and transparent with make a wish you know everything's on our website uh, our, our financial statements etc so what i love about make a wish is that um expenses don't exceed eight percent oh we, yeah so it's really it really we really keep it down to the very bare minimum so that the money that is donated really goes to the wish really goes to the child you know and not on on other stuff. So now, you know, it depends on, you know, some, some wishes, um, even if it's quite a, a basic wish, you know, in Malaysia, we, we don't have uh, people wishing for like meeting David Beckham or things like that, right? They do like overseas. But here, um, you know, some of our wish kids, they just want an iPad. Mm. And why do they want an iPad? Because they're going through chemo and they want to be able to browse on the internet and read. So, just because the wish is like that, we try to make the day and the journey uh, as amazing. So we give a lot of other stuff and we, you know, maybe take them to the theme park or, or an arcade, mm. uh, you know, because they love video games and that sort of thing. So, so it's, um, we try to be as creative and as fun with lots of surprises for, for the wish child. And the beauty of, I mean, I'm sure Belinda, you'll know, so 
like basically um, the volunteers would meet up with a child and find out what they want mm. you know, what are the likes so colors uh, food um, activities so it's not just about the wish itself but it's about everything that that wish child really likes and enjoys and then we'll create a whole wish journey around that so you know i had that list as well when i was sending toys and okay this one likes lego or this one likes frozen okay i'll send like or my little pony and you know, <laughs> I, i've become very good at buying toys <laughs> And you become very creative as well because you have to think up of ways of surprising them or making them excited, right? Exactly. Uh, One of my, um, you know, before the MCO last year, I did, um, I I tried to do events just beyond the the wish as well so that, you know, we don't forget our past wish kits as well. Mm. So what we did uh, last year was um, with uh, collaboration with TGV Cinemas is that we did a private screening of Frozen 2. So we got all the wish kits and their families who could come and make it to see the screening of Frozen 2. So the, the cinema hall was just for them. And so, I, of course, I was there. I wanted to <laughs> The perks of the job. Yeah. <laughs> gifts and uh, we had the popcorn and the soft drinks and everything. And I was sitting next to uh, dear Alicia, the wish child I was talking about earlier. Yeah. She was squealing and laughing and like throughout the whole movie. And I was just laughing, just watching her, how she was really enjoying herself. And at the end of that, at the end, when they all went home, I thought, oh, this is just exactly what we do. You know, it's about... It's about always keeping in touch with the, with the wish kids and the family and the, also the volunteers were there enjoying themselves. So that was a, it was a good thing that we did before, before the MCO. <laughs> now, people say charity begins at home, right? Um, it's all about upbringing. How did your parents ingrain social responsibility in you? Well, actually, my mom's always done a lot of charity and I used to follow her around. But when, um, when I was sent to boarding school very young at age 10, so we already started doing charity work at my school when we were 10 years old. We were volunteering for British Red Cross um, and also uh, I was a volunteer at Cheshire Homes for the mm. old folks' homes. So I used to, when I was 13 years old, I used to make hot chocolate for them, talk to them, because, you know, they're, they're quite lonely, right? Yeah. Put them to bed. So these are the kind of things that we did when, we, when I was a kid um, back at boarding school. And uh, when I was 17, I organized my uh, a fashion show. I wanted to do a fashion show to do fundraising. And, but my fashion show was with a twist. I did dance choreography. So I got all my friends to actually dance to my choreography. <laughs> but you know what? We sold out. I sold out the tickets in the school hall. Um, we raised 300 pounds. And at that time, 300 pounds was a lot for me. <laughs> so, and that went to British Red Cross and the Cleft Palette Association. So, wow. Yeah. And because of that, my school uh, made me the school prefect because, you know, it was something that we or I organized with my friend mm. by ourselves and uh, just took it on. And, and so charity has always been something that I've done at a very young age, um, something that I've always wanted to do. OK, um, but growing up as a royal, did you ever feel like you were pressured into, you know, you know, because you're under society's telescope? You, 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 yeah. Do you ever feel I pressured? Did to do charity work or did it just come naturally? I, I think for me, it just comes naturally because we, we're, not, we're not told to do you know, charity work. We don't have those kinds of, as a princess, you don't have the, the roles and responsibilities that are set out. So it's really up to you how you want to give back or not mm. <laughs> and for me it was always something that I wanted to do there was if there's a cause that I'm passionate about um, or giving back to the community you know I've been um, a volunteer with Kachara Soup Kitchen feeding the homeless and the urban poor and PPR flats since 2015 I did a zero food wastage initiative since 2016 which oh. is saving surplus food awesome. to give to the needy we have saved like 10,000 tons. And from now, I've also been working as board of trustee on the Yayasan Food Bank Malaysia. So there's lots of things that I, that I do. If it's something that I'm passionate about, I'm like, well, why just sit there and not yeah. do it? You know, go out and do it. So it doesn't matter what scale. It doesn't have to be huge. You know, when I started a Zero Food Waste, it was just me writing to a couple of hotels saying, can you give us the surplus food from the Ramadan buffets? And they're like, yeah, sure. 
And that's how it started. And every year it just grew and grew. My list of hotels grew. And, um, you know, the, the, and, and, you know, even like one time I visited a school as part of the ambassador of Stand Together, Say No More to Bullying. I saw the school and I saw the, the library. I said, oh, the books are really old and worn. I said, I gotta get them books, you know, like, because how, you know, to be motivated to read, you gotta have nice books and they all look so worn. So I said, like, okay. So I worked with uh, Borders Malaysia and we donated 800 books, new books to the school. And, uh, and I keep on donating books to my kids in the PPR flats. And I always encourage them and motivate them to be um, you know, to study hard and to keep learning. And I said, you know, the top 20 learners will get to come with me to Kidsania. So you can imagine, you know, I gave them a timeline, like three months. You've got to really study hard and you show me how dedicated you are. If you're the top 20 learners, so you don't have to have fantastic grade, but you show you have a dedication. And they all came for the first time. They've never been to Kidsania and they had so much fun and, um, you know, learn a lot of different jobs they have the radio station there too <laughs> I, I, yep. I see yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah so it was uh, you know those are kind of activities that i that you know if i see there's a need giving back to the community then i think you know we can all do something about it right i'm just wondering about the teams uh, that you work with all these charitable organizations they're like uh so I think it was Natasha's here get her to go and speak to these people <laughs> guaranteed can get it done one right because you're good you're not not only do uh, you I mean like you're obviously royal but you you have great PR you also get them to jump on board and do more than uh, they're required to right well you know it's not always that easy <laughs> they really? call me no they call me the persistent princess because I <laughs> never give up <laughs> Are you sure it's persistent or pushy? I mean, I'm not sure which one, <laughs> which one I fall under. But there are times when you know you always get a no. There are yeah. there are times when people can't come forward or they they don't they don't want to get involved. So you know you just have to keep on going and keep on pushing. When I started with talking about plastic pollution in 2016, uh, nobody was talking about plastic. Back then, it was not a concern, and I kept on going, and I kept on talking. People are like, what, what? you're like the plastic police. You keep talking about plastic. <laughs> you know? But now, everyone's talking about it, and everyone realizes that there is this massive you know, problem. That is, it's a crisis. So, you know, persistence is key. <laughs> the persistent princess. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> but what is it that drives you? you know? what, what is it that motivates you to keep on pushing? and keep on doing all these things that you're doing? Because I'm sure there are times when you're just like, I'm so tired, you know, I just want to take a break and be a princess for a while, you know? <laughs> well, you know, um, I think it's the fact that when I can see there's a result that's being achieved, you know, there was a time when I started many years back, I thought to myself, why is everybody just ranting on their Facebook? Mm. You know, if you want to make change, don't just rant, do something. And I tell that to all the university kids because I do a lot of lectures at uni, uh, universities, and I tell them, do what you're passionate about. You know, if what, whatever the effort, whatever the cause, whether it's for the environment or for the homeless or the urban poor or for kids or for make-a-wish, if there's something that you want to do, just go for it and do it. And you can influence your friends, you can influence your teachers, your parents, your family, and before you know it, you've influence your community yeah so it's like a dominoes effect you know so i said don't because a lot of them ask me you know but i'm not a princess mm. you don't have to be a princess <laughs> to do something yeah. no matter how small and um, just one small effort becomes something really huge in the end so so that's my that's always my message to everybody just do what you're passionate about there has to be something okay but how can someone get involved in charitable causes? And I guess the most important question here is why should they get involved in charitable causes? Well, there's so many that they can choose from. I mean, you can research for NGOs. There's a lot of NGOs doing great work. So whatever the cause, let's say it's an environment. Um, I organize uh, beach cleanups before, before the MCO. I always have like a couple of beach cleanups a year. And do you know that most of them are my junior eco-warriors? There's one girl, she's 10 years old. She told her mom, mom, I want to go and do the princess beach cleanup. Her mom was like, 
uh, we have to drive like two hours to this beach and you want to clean up on your Saturday morning. It's like 7 a.m., right? And, then, and the, the girl was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. So mom would have to drive all the way to, you know, Pantai Morib and we'd be doing the cleanup for a couple of hours. And uh, that gives me a lot of pleasure to see like how, how the young are really motivated because they realize they have a voice. They've got, they can, if they have action, that something can be done. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever is the cause that you believe in. So it doesn't have to be just for charity. It's just the cause that you are passionate about. Mm-hmm. So are you going to call it that though? The Princess Beach Cleanup? <laughs> I call it the Slango Beach Cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> I think PBC works so much better. The Princess Beach Cleanup, right? Yeah. But why should people, why should, okay. why should people support a cause or why should they, you know, yeah, I think, you know, especially with the MCO, with what's happening with COVID, um, I've seen a lot of Malaysians get out there and supporting, whether it's the frontliners, whether it is, you know, getting PPE gowns to all the frontliners. I think what's amazing is that when you realize there's a cause beyond um, just just sitting at home and not really giving back to the community, then you realize that you're actually adding something that's more fulfilling to your, to your, to your, to your life. You know, mm-hmm. we don't just live in a bubble. We have to be, you know, um, we have to be connected. And the way to be connected is by finding that cause. Like for me, if it's about bullying, school bullying, that, that's something that's very, very dear to me. So I go around and I'll talk about it and I'll, I'll try and share about, you know, school bullying and how we have to show kindness, how we have to show compassion. And uh, I'm sure everyone somewhere along the line has come across some sort of, you know, nasty comments, mm. social bullying, and they don't realize it's even bullying. Some of the bullies don't even realize what they're doing. So it's about how to stand up for yourself. It's about, you know, how to protect yourself and also to look at why the bully is doing what they're doing so all these things is um you know i i think that if 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 it's something that's close to you that that is affecting you instead of sitting there and not doing something about it is to feel empowered by doing something yeah and you can empower yourself and you can empower others as well Mm. nicely said but like you know we have people who have lots of excuses i don't have the extra money to donate to these charities. I don't have time to spare for these less fortunate. What else can they do, you know? I think when you, um, you know, yeah, I mean, for me, I always say to like some of the school kids, you know, if you, you can do fundraisers, you can do a challenge. Let's say you want to challenge yourself. I just read about this yesterday. This 10 year old boy in the UK is doing a triathlon that is like one of, it's, it's like going from, Par- from, from England to Paris. I mean, he's 10 years old and he's doing it as a fundraiser. And I said, wow, just imagining how, how many kilometers he's clocking in just to raise money because he doesn't have the money himself, but he's mm. challenging himself to say, hey, support me. I'm going to do this for charity. And, you know, it's like the 100-year-old guy that was from the UK. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sir Thomas More. Yeah, yeah, he walked. Yeah. I mean, those are kind of like, it's an inspiration. So you don't have to, you know, even if you, let's say you decide to do a marathon uh, or say you want to do a cleanup and say, okay, you know, you could, kids can do a lot of fundraisers out there. So I always find even like washing a car, <laughs> we'll wash cars and we'll raise money and this is going to charity. Why not? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's so many ideas. You can be so creative and uh, people are willing to give and support for a good cause. How much a role does a parent play in sort of push or bringing this out of a child, a, a, a compassion, I guess, for the less fortunate? Definitely parents play a huge role because, um, you know, I was very grateful that my mom always showed me uh, by taking me to a lot of uh, the, you know, when we did with Zakat, we were visiting the kampong, giving back, uh, we were giving food or visiting, visiting places um, and realizing that, you know, we are blessed in so many ways and there are many out there who do not have that, you know, who are not so fortunate, who are less fortunate. So when I even did uh, Kachara first time in 2015 and I saw in my own eyes, it's a very eye-opening experience to see, um, to see homeless on the streets in KL. And that's when I thought, you know, I've got to do something beyond just volunteering. I've got to try and help and get 
and change, make a change. And that's where uh, zero food wastage came up mm. uh, a year later because I was like, we have so much, 230,000 tons of food is thrown away in one month of Ramadan. I said, and we have so many people who are hungry mm. um, and uh, don't have food. I said, this is a win-win, you know, putting the surplus food so it doesn't go to the landfill to feed um, the, the, the homeless and the urban poor. And they're not even used to having such wonderful hotel food. Yeah. You know? Some of them last year, they were like, oh, I just have to eat. They're really aware of coming along every night so every night we pick up from different places all around Klang Valley um, and then we even increased it we did it in other states we did it in Penang we did it in Malacca Johor um, you know we really spread out the, 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 the activity and uh, got to as many you know those in need mm. so yeah I mean when you see it with your own eyes even like with make a wish when you meet the wish child and you, you're involved, you know, when you come on the wish journey and you see it with yourself, you think, oh, there's more that I can do. Mm-hmm. And it is really about the experience of realizing, you know, we are so blessed. We're so fortunate, but many, many out there are not. So yeah. that, that's where the need comes in to give back. But there's only so many hours in a day for you. I mean, like you, it sounds like you're doing so much. <laughs> How do you split your time, your focus? And, and in this case, I mean, doing charitable causes, how do you even split? split up your heart in a way yeah to which one has more focus well i give it all equal i know it sounds crazy but, <laughs> but i focus on on um as as much as i can when when the need arises so yeah i mean i'm also sitting on on, on boards of uh, uh, as a board of trustee for different foundations so you know i just work full-time basically trying to give back and trying to think of creative ways if there's a need even like for my kids at the ppr flats they um they enjoy playing football chaining football every saturday so i invited them down we got out of bus invited them to Alam stadium to watch the sultan slango cup um we my brother organizes like football slango day so i got them to come and you could, should have seen their faces last year when the fas bus arrived at the PPR flat <laughs> and they were like we are getting on the FAS bus <laughs> like like the, the footballers so they all piled into the bus they were taken to Sha'alam Stadium they're in the FAS locker they're all given the shirts and they're training on the pitch at the Sha'alam Stadium with the former coaches and players I mean they had a full whole day and I said this and my point of that is to say to motivate them, to inspire them. You know, you work hard, if you do something you believe you, you believe in and you know improve yourself, you know, good things can come to you. So so I keep doing as many activities as I can, trying to be as creative as I can to to give back to them. But how's it work though? I mean like do people always like some NGO, do you get like letters and hey, would you like to be on our board? Would you like to help us out? Or do you <laughs> constantly go online and I'm like, oh I like this, I like this, I like this, do I have time for this? Yeah. It's a mix of both, actually. I mean, if it's a p- cause that I'm, I'm passionate about, then I'll be like, yeah, I want to do that. And if someone comes forward and says, you know, like in MCO, uh, a lot of people are talking about plastic, but I said, you know, we have to understand, we have to support local businesses. So mm-hmm. I said, that wasn't really my focus. But what I realized that came out of COVID was the, the masks and the gloves being littered in the street. I said, we have to talk about this. We have to share to people that we don't want any more litter because it's actually dangerous. It's a, yeah. it's a biohazard having a mask littered on the floor. Just throw it in the bin, you know? So I came up with a campaign and I collaborated with Reef Check Malaysia and the campaign um, on World, uh, World Environment Day was hashtag no more litter, hashtag because we care. And so this went viral. We got everybody to hold up the signs to say, you know, no more litter because we care. And that is the hashtag we've been using a lot just to share to everybody like, look, you know, your masks, your disposable masks or your gloves, throw it in the bin properly so that other people don't get contaminated by it. Mm. You know? So this is the kind of thing when I see there is a need or a message to talk about, I'll get in there. <laughs> Now, uh, finally, what's your advice? Uh, any last advice to Malaysians who would like to do more for society, but maybe don't know where to start or don't know what to do? Well, there's always, um, I mean, there's so much that you can do and you can either be creating something on your own with your friends 
or you know, with your class, with your school. Uh, just look it up. Everything is online. That's the beauty of what we have right now is that you know, social media. I share a lot of my 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 work that I do, and you know, so if you're interested in the environment or if you're interested in helping out, um, you know, volunteer at the soup kitchen. You know, a lot of people even cooking food when they saw during MCO that we were giving food um, to the to the urban poor. They're like, okay, we've got seven hundred uh, meal sets that we are cooking and we're going to give to you so i mean you know it's uh there's so much that everyone can do mm -hmm. and it gives me a lot of heart to see that a lot of people are doing so much as well so you've got to always, i always have to remind myself that you know everyone out there is pulling in some way somehow um even with like you guys are sharing this message online on air and uh, you know it's it's important that we all know that we can come together and we can achieve anything if we do it together you know so if you guys are interested in any kind of charity, just go out there, research. You know, there's a lot of role models out there. <laughs> I'm actually very interested in the, your say no to plastic. The, and I, I'd love to be a part of that because I, I try to do some environmental work as well. So I, I, the next time you're doing something, I'm, I'm definitely on board. All right. Awesome. Then Kuzata Sha was the first person to start the hashtag say no to plastic. Say no to plastic. Yes. And I'm sure you had a role in, uh, in, in the... You know, we were Slango has banned pl single-use plastic, like for for on Saturdays. I yeah. think in supermarkets and all that. You had a handle, and, yeah. and now it's statewide. So it's since uh, twenty seventeen, it was on. I think before it was many years uh, on Saturday. Now it became statewide. Yeah. But we still have to remember, you know, like come, going to the to the wet market. You know, I bring my tiffin if I go to the bazaar Ramadan or I go to food trucks. You know, at the food trucks, they call me the girl with the tiffin. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, ah, it's the girl with the tiffin. So I'm like, I need to up and put it in my tiffin because I don't want to have a container that I'm going to throw away. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, then tiffins became the in thing. So I was like, yes, you know, if we can create, you know, that kind of momentum and yeah. everybody. Well, but yes, definitely. I hope once things get better, we can do more cleanups, uh, beach cleanups. I also do dive underwater cleanups. Wow. That's really yeah. yeah, that's quite hard. <laughs> because I'm like, are you sure that's, that's trash? <laughs> <laughs> Can't really tell with all that coral and <laughs> right, yeah. bottom of the <laughs> so are you sure that, that's a plastic bottle? Okay, yeah, it looks like a plastic bottle. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, we you know we collect um, loads, but now even like with Ocean Conservancy, they said there's going to be two new categories they're adding on, which is the PPE. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Found themselves now they're all in the rivers, they're in the sea, and uh, it's an added, you know, an, an added environmental concern. Mm. So you know, definitely a princess. With a heart of gold, there's yeah. nothing that you cannot do when you put your mind to it, right? Absolutely, I agree. If you put your mind to it, your heart into it, you know, that's, um, you, you realize when you just open your eyes to, to an experience or to something, then you realize like, you know what, I need to do something. I have to do something. So that, 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 is, what, um, that is what, you know, charity and giving back is all about, right? I'm just trying to uh, see, imagine you walking around a palace, picking up, like, no plastic here, no plastic here, <laughs> telling your dad and everything. Like, oh. I don't know whether... <laughs> you know, I, I, the first thing I said to the, to the palace, to Istan, I said, no more plastic bottles, yeah? <laughs> wow. And then the, all the plastic straws, no more, no more plastic straws. So everything was removed. There were no more plastic bottles. There were no more straws. We, I said, we've got to, you know, and that's one of the things that I always say. I said, you've got to walk the talk. Mm. So you really have to, 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 to make people believe in what you're doing is that you have to do it yourself and you can show by example, you know, lead by example. So I share like how I've reduced my plastic um, consumption in, in at home and you know by going out with the tiffins and I also make sure all my friends do the same thing so when we go and eat at the food trucks I'm like none of you are bringing <laughs> any yeah. plastic okay so they all bring their reusables everybody has to have their reusables I can so see you going zero waste <laughs> I can see you going hello tiffin <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So the guys will come with their Tupperware because I like to think it's a little bit too feminine, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they'll come with their Tupperwares. And I'm like, even, you know, to think about your, your water, I always bring my water tumbler, my mm. reusable water tumbler. So they all come with their water tumblers. I'm like, you don't need to buy 
plastic water bottles, mm-hmm. you know, put it up at home and, uh, and uh, you know, think less of what you have to throw away. That, that's the way. So yeah, all my friends are like aware <laughs> there's no plastic. And if I see plastic, it's like death stare, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dunku Zatasha, for speaking to us. This thank you great. so much for having me. So, really such fun. a great conversation. I'm sure you'll be able to inspire a whole lot more um, people, you know, you. in thank all you. the things that you're passionate about.